Hello everyone and welcome to another DNALC Live Short. My name is Sharon Pepinella and today we're going to discuss DNA packaging. Now when I think of DNA packaging, I'm reminded of the quote from the book, DNA Replication in Human Disease, which states, if you were to stretch all of the DNA in your adult body out, it would measure nearly 20 trillion meters. This is approximately 100 times the distance from the earth to the sun. You would likely not survive this. Well, all joking aside, it is clear that the packaging of DNA within the eukaryotic nucleus is important, and this is for a number of reasons. So this packaging is dynamic, and what that means is it can change, and this is important for influencing things like gene expression. Now, there are two schools of thought behind the evolution of compaction of DNA within the nucleus. And the first is that the DNA packaging evolved out of the need to be able to fit this abundance of DNA within the nucleus. However, other scientists argue that the DNA's innate ability to compact is actually what allowed the DNA to accumulate in the nucleus over time. So additionally, as mentioned, DNA packaging is important for cellular processes. Why does DNA packaging play a role with this? Well, direct accessibility to the DNA itself or the lack thereof is actually really important for regulating things like transcription as well as DNA replication and repair. Now you've likely heard of chromosomes, which are highly condensed structures of DNA that are formed throughout the stages of mitosis. But DNA is not always found in this incredibly compact state. In its simplest form, DNA packaging begins at the level of the nucleosome, where nuclear DNA interacts with special proteins called histones to form what look like these repetitive spools of wrapped DNA. The connected nucleosomes give the appearance of a beads on a string, as observed in this electron micrograph picture here and this pictorial representation here. Uh, and this occurs when these are generally in low salt solutions. However, it's unlikely that these particular extended structures exist in this state naturally. So let's look further into the structure of the nucleosome itself. There are four histone proteins, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. And they comprise what's known as the histone optimer. Now histones H3 and H4 uh, form what's known as the central stable tetramer, which is flanked by a pair of H2A and H2B dimers, as you can see here. Now, approximately 147 base pairs of DNA is wrapped twice around this histone core optimer, and a fifth histone, linker histone H1, binds at the, to the nucleosome near the position where the DNA enters and exits the nucleosome. So you can see that here and here, and it generally assists with uh, compaction, chromatin compaction. So another important feature of these core histones are the histone tail domains that are represented here as fully extended polypeptides. There are 10 tails in total, so eight N-terminal tails, one for each histone, and these are named for the amine group at the end of each tail, and two C-terminal tails of histone H2A, and these are named for the carboxyl group at the end of those histone tails. Now, looking at all of these tails, you can see that they reach for some distance with the potential to contact other nucleosomal elements pretty easily. So this is important for the formation of these compact DNA and protein structures, known as chromatin, and the further compaction of chromatin into larger, complex structures. Now, there are a number of places where the histone tails can actually interact within a chromatin structure. So this can be to nucleosomal DNA, and this is either within the histone's own nucleosome, then this is known as an intranucleosomal interaction, or with the DNA on a neighboring nucleosome, and this is known as an internucleosomal interaction. Histone tails can interact with linker DNA, and this is DNA that uh, connects uh, successive nucleosomes. Histones can interact with other histones. Again, this can be intranucleosomally or internucleosomally. And finally, histones can interact with other non-histone proteins. Now, many of these interactions contribute to the formation of these chromatin structures. And it's important to note that these interactions can rearrange to accommodate or even promote different stages of chromatin folding. Now, if we look at the big picture here, we can see that the double-stranded DNA okay, interacts with histone proteins to form the nucleosomes. 
And the nucleosomes are those basic repeating units of chromatin. Now through histone tail interactions and additional factors, the nucleosomes are regularly positioned to form uh, chromatin fibers. And these are often referred to as the 30 nanometer fiber due to the fact that the fiber forms these loops that are approximately 30 nanometers in length. Now these fibers are found within the interphase nucleus, though the packaging of the DNA can change throughout the cell cycle or in response to epigenetic stimuli. So in turn, it can fold into higher order chromatin structures like the chromosomes or decondense to allow access to the DNA. So I hope that's been a helpful short for you about DNA packaging. Uh, I encourage you to visit our DNALC website for the rest of our DNALC live content and resources. And as always, we encourage you to follow us on social media. See you next time.